Great music is the soundtrack to our lives. It makes the ordinary extraordinary and creates emotion and meaning that transcends the limitations of language. Music is universal in a way nothing else can be and affects nearly every art form and human endeavor. No matter how good the movie or how great the game, the soundtrack provides the personality that becomes forever entwined with your memories and experience. When combined with other art forms like film and video games, it creates a powerful and everlasting connection, bringing you right back to those moments when you first experienced them. When it comes to some of the most epic, engaging, and memorable musical experiences in gaming, few genres can claim the crown of best in class, like shoot 'em ups. There's something about blasting your way through hordes of enemies, background scrolling without mercy raining destruction upon wave after wave that demands only the best soundtrack to complete the experience. From the earliest shooting games, from the most basic of chiptunes, developers knew that a killer soundtrack to excite the player and absorb them into the experience was a must. As music transitioned from programmed chiptunes to recorded instruments and CD-based games, epic compositions normally reserved for feature films opened a world of possibilities. Not just memorable, catchy tunes, but moody compositions that immersed you further into the world the designers created. So this video is a celebration of some of the best soundtracks in shooting game history. From the 8-bit days to present, the games, the developers, and the composers that helped shape the music of shooting games, and a big part of why they hold such a nostalgic place in our memories. Xevious was the game that kicked off the scrolling shooter in 1982, influencing all others that would follow. And it wasn't long before other developers, porting it to nearly every platform that existed, created their own versions of the game and music tracks. One of the most prolific at the time was Compile, on the popular MSX computer. Compile were masters of their craft, and they took it to yet another level with their PC Engine port, adding an all-new game and revamped soundtrack that had Xevious never sounding so good. Compile's own series, Xanet, which built upon the formula, also featured classic 8-bit tunes and was a precursor to the magic they continue to pull off with more powerful hardware. But even their 8-bit chip tunes from the later Alesta series, Gunnack, and Guardian Legend, not to mention their MSX games, were some of the most impressive compositions of the time.
probably the biggest name and influence in early game music and the industry as a whole, was Konami, responsible for the most popular franchises in gaming history. They had a large, dedicated team devoted to music, the Konami Kukeha Club. And while they promoted all their music as a team effort, it was Miki Higashino that composed two of their most classic shooting game soundtracks, the original Gradius and Salamander, aka Life Force, two games whose musical brilliance needs no introduction. While many can point to these games as their peak of the arcade era, Konami was also prolific on the MSX, producing some of the best chiptunes of the time. Much like the Sega Master System, the MSX was capable of both standard PSG and FM sound, using the Yamaha YM chipset so common in arcades. But Konami also developed their own chipset, the SCC, and used its expanded capability to produce some phenomenal tracks. And as the generation progressed into the 16-bit era, Konami continued their support of shooting games in arcade and at home with brilliant work like Gradius 3 and Axelay on the Super Nintendo. Of course, Konami was just a part of the great music of the early 90s, as it was also the golden age for STGs. As their popularity exploded in arcades, home computers and consoles followed, with Nintendo, Sega, and Hudson Soft all releasing loads of shooters for their platforms. With hundreds upon hundreds of STGs across all systems, so came an avalanche of incredible music from developers big and small that solidified the genre as a musical tour de force. At the forefront of this shooting revolution were a handful of developers that pushed the limits of what was possible on the hardware. On Sega's Mega Drive, none became more well known than Technosoft with the Thunder Force series. Taking full advantage of the Yamaha FM chipset, the soundtracks to Thunder Force 3 and 4 were widely considered some of the best on the system. The Mega Drive was home to over 60 shooters, and almost to a fault, they took advantage of that raw, gritty sound of the Yamaha, a sound that became synonymous with the console. Toaplan, another prolific arcade developer with several STGs, now considered classics, translated nearly every arcade port to the Mega Drive, even making improvements in many of their compositions. Their two brilliant programmers and musicians 
Masahiro Yuge and Tatsuya Umura are responsible for the great music for most of their classics, like Zero Wing, Hellfire, and Tatsujin. While the FM synthesis approach of the Mega Drive was born of an earlier generation, and it did have its limitations, producing a sound that would rarely be mistaken for actual instruments. It also gave the Mega Drive its character, and is still a reason why it's so widely used today by musicians and fans alike for new compositions. It's a combination of both nostalgia and capability that gave it an unmistakable sound. Unlike the Mega Drive and other systems of the time, which used custom sound chips, the Super Famicom had its own entire subsystem. Developed by Ken Kutaragi of Sony, it used a proprietary chipset with its own 8-bit CPU, a DSP, and dedicated pool of RAM. In terms of sheer capability, it was a step forward for music composition on home consoles. While it was certainly capable of some rockin' FM-style music, like those found in R-Type 3, most games took advantage of the sound in different ways. Two shining examples were Capcom's UN Squadron and Compile's Super Elesta, both with memorable jazzy tunes, giving each game their unique personality. Compositions that were more complex and higher bitrate samples of real instruments that the competition couldn't match. Despite the superior sound hardware of Nintendo's console, likely because it could recreate such a wide range of music, it also never developed a trademark sound, like the Mega Drive. In fact, in terms of pushing the music of video games forward into the next generation, it was the very first console of the 16-bit era, released before both the Mega Drive and the Super Famicom, that brought music into the next generation. Hudson Soft's PC Engine. In its early days, without a Yamaha chipset or FM synthesis, it couldn't reproduce the gritty sound of the arcade. Instead, Hudson took a novel approach, using what was called wavetable lookup synthesis, an early form of recorded digital instruments. Being a console that was heavily focused on shooters, with over 100 unique titles of its own, there was no shortage of phenomenal chip tunes. Using short digital samples to recreate nearly any sound the composer wanted, along with six sound channels, the PC Engine Shooter Library had some of the most melodic soundtracks of the era. However, 
it wasn't the base PC Engine chiptunes that revolutionized video game music and brought it into the modern age. It was Hudson's release of the very first CD system attachment all the way back in 1989 that signaled the beginning of the end for programmed chiptunes and the dawn of fully recorded 16-bit CD music in video games. Now, talented musicians, bands, and orchestras could simply record live music and encode to CD. This revolution signaled the rise to prominence of bands like Zuntada and Tease Music, able to compose without limitation or any need of coding for three years until the release of the Mega CD by Sega, Hudson owned the market. T's music created legendary tracks for some of Hudson's most popular games like Gate and Lords of Thunder. incredible remixes for classic games like Cotton and Hellfire. While the CD format didn't guarantee all composers would create quality music, it opened the door for unfettered creativity by some of the industry's best. While Nintendo stubbornly clung to their cartridge format for another generation and also abandoned the shooting genre completely, Bad Nintendo, bad. Both Sega and newcomer Sony embraced the CD format with their 32-bit consoles, along with continuing support for STGs. With the added power this generation, arcade perfect ports became the norm, even exceeding them musically in many cases. One of the most renowned bands that came into their own during this time was Zuntada, with their otherworldly and experimental tracks. Creating music for legendary developer Taito, going back to their earliest games, their classic Darius music transformed from evocative chiptunes into haunting ballads with eerie voices. perfectly complementing the psychedelic voyage and giving the series its trademark atmosphere. Being Taito's in-house band, if you were playing a Taito game, chances are you were listening to Zuntada. Zuntada has won multiple accolades for their work and is still one of the most recognized bands in gaming. The mid to late 90s was also the rise of Cave, legendary bullet hell developer, and with them, one of the most famous music composers in STG history, Manabu Namiki.
like a who's who of cave music, he was responsible for so many soundtracks that an entire video could be created around his work alone. First working with Ryzen in his early days to compose the music for Battle Garega and Great Maho Daisakusa. He followed up with the music for the Dodonpachi series, Ketsui, Esp Galuda, Mushihima Sama, and Death Smiles. lent his work to M2 for Gradius Rebirth and still continues to work to this day, most recently with his awesome soundtrack for the new Game Gear Alesta 3, also by M2. The CD era was a no-holds-barred free-for-all with developers big and small finding the most talented musicians to create the perfect soundtrack for their games. As the shooting genre began to lose popularity after the mid-90s, and the majority of new games shifted from large developers to smaller indie houses. Less well-known, but no less talented musicians had the opportunity to score the majority of upcoming indie schmucks to also promote their work. Even in the early days, a small indie developer, NG Dev Team, often partnered with DJ Raphael Dill to ensure their games consistently had some of the hottest music in the genre. With games like Neozix, Gunlord, and especially Last Hope, creating a perfect atmosphere for a game that's far easier on the ears than it ever was to play. Suke Yasui, working for indie developer Q, has consistently put together some of the best soundtracks in modern shooting games, up to and including the recent Natsuki Chronicles. And his masterpiece of work for Eskatos remains one of the greatest STG soundtracks ever created. Music transitions into a dreamy space synth with 80s beats as you travel toward the moon, later pulling off the coolest homage to space invaders that I've seen in a game. This is one soundtrack you may be picking up if you fall in love with the game like I did. It's one of the best you'll ever hear. The 
the ability to directly record music even allowed small, one-person operations with games made on a budget and created during their spare time to still showcase their musical talent. No better example exists than Zoom, sole creator of the Toho series, not only known for its fandom, but also the incredible soundtracks that he's created for over two dozen games dating back to 1995. Zune previously worked for Taito on games like Civalian, and his time with the company inspired much of his work that you can clearly hear in the Toho games. Despite the superior nature of CD music, the old chiptunes still hold a very special place in our memories. In many cases, we even prefer them. After all, the most memorable and classic tunes that we still have nostalgia for today came from the era before CD music even existed. And yet these rudimentary, memory-limited chipsets and audio samples created the themes for our most beloved series. Maybe it was the technical limitations that brought out the creativity from developers. Or maybe it's those primal sounds they produced that gave them their character. Like the PC Engine that sounded like an angry bee out to sting the competition to death. or the Yamaha FM chip that made many arcade games and Sega consoles sound like no others on the market. It made us remember them specifically for those reasons and why such a fan base still exists for new music being created that replicates the sound of the originals. part of that era rarely discussed were the popular home computers. Not just the MSX, but the Commodore 64, Amiga, ZX Spectrum, the Sharp 68000, and many more. All systems with a huge array of games with wonderful music that's rarely explored. The most famous sound was the SID chip in the Commodore systems. Designed by Bob Yanes, who later founded the Insonic Digital Synth Company, regarded as a beast for its time, and beyond anything else on the market, the Commodore was like a musical instrument with a computer attached. Many European musicians learned how to produce their music because they owned a C64 at a younger age, and its sound influence their compositions for the next generation. The 
Amiga was also well known for games with some great tunes, and its Paula sound chip that worked independent of the CPU, creating soundtracks that exceeded what could be done on home consoles upon its release. Then there was the late Sharp 68000, another beast with its sound options and rolling cards exceeding most arcade boards of the time, and producing some of the most impressive arcade perfect ports, and unique chiptunes of that final generation. Sharp was designed to be a graphical and music workstation, and was compatible with all of the Roland MIDI synthesizers, and developers took advantage by making their games with MIDI tracks, which helped give it that reputation of being better than the arcade. Computer gaming in general, from the earliest days, was full of shooting games, and to this day, when the mainstream has all but forgotten them, it's the same modern PC games and indie developers that have carried the torch for decades. Many games so good, with such great music, that it's a crime they aren't known and played more. You've heard the classics, you've played the legends, and you'll never forget what they mean to you. But now it's time to create new memories. With new games that you've yet to explore, by new musicians whose music you've yet to hear. Some are modern and CD quality, others sound like the chiptunes of old creating new compositions using the tools of yesteryear. And lots of them, more than you know, are shoot-'em-ups. Because shoot-'em-ups are making a comeback. The games were there, it was most of us that were absent. But no longer, it's us, the shooting game fans, that are back. How do we bring the genre back to prominence? By staying back, by playing the games, by building a community around them, by supporting the developers out there that deserve it. So making shooting games is profitable again. Sharing the games with your kids and friends, and enjoying the great music that's such an integral part of why we fell in love with them in the first place.